sermon off from Br- Brother Banning, and I want to give him full credit for that. Um, but we want to talk uh, this morning about the story of Carl McCunn. And I want to give you a little information about um, Carl. We're going to use Carl as kind of a, a parable. Jesus talked about people and their stories in parables that we can learn from. And that's what we're going to do with, with Carl. Now, I may give you a little more information about Carl than you, than you really want. <laughs> but I want you to get to know Carl and, and kind of develop some some rapport, some feelings for Carl. So um, this is a picture of Carl, I think, as a younger man. This is a picture of Carl later in life. Um, Carl was born to a military family. In fact, he was born in Germany when his dad was stationed over in Germany. And so he grew up a, what they like to often call, military brat. And eventually they made it back to the States, and he grew up in San Antonio, Texas, where he went to high school. Well, after high school, he wasn't quite sure what he wanted to do, so he tried his hand at community college, but that just didn't work out. That, he just wasn't kind of that college type of person. He had other interests and other um, uh, strengths. And so after only one semester, he dropped out and did what he kind of came to know growing up. He joined the military. He served four years in the Navy and then moved to Seattle, Washington. Now, I don't know if that's where he was stationed uh, last. I'm not exactly sure why he made it to Seattle. But he lived for a period of time after the Navy in Seattle, Washington, and then eventually moved to Alaska. Now, Alaska was the perfect fit for Carl. He finally found his love and his niche in life because Carl started becoming involved with photography. And not just photography. Carl fell in love with photographing wildlife, wild animals. And you can imagine why Carl fell in love with Alaska. You can't find really a better place to find beautiful wildlife to photograph. And so he moved to Alaska and began to be involved in his love. Um, In 1976, so this goes back a ways, he decided to go on a trip all by himself with his camera and he spent five months alone in what was known as Brooks Range, Alaska. He lived out there in the summer months, the early spring, the summer months and lived out there in the the wild and took picture after picture after picture and he loved it. The time went by so quickly that he started planning another trip from five years later. It takes a while to plan these trips. And so in 1981, he decided to do it again, to make another five-month trip, hoping that maybe, if things work out, it could be even longer than that. So to live out in the Alaskan wilderness, it takes a lot of planning. And so Carl began planning meticulously. Uh, He got 500 rolls of film. He got 1,400 pounds of provisions, food and, and medical supplies and anything else he could figure out that he would need. He took three rifles because he was going to be out in the wild among some very dangerous wild animals. He took one journal. He was going to journal uh, his five-month trip out there. And then, very important, he took one bush pilot. He, He hired a bush pilot to take him exactly where he wanted to go and to drop him off. And so Carl finally had it all planned out. 
And this is where he ended up, about 225 miles northeast of Fairbanks, Alaska. Um, so he's there in the, the early spring. He's there in the summer months. This is a picture of where he uh, ended up grow, uh, uh, camping. You can see they got the water. You got some of the flatlands. You got the beautiful trees. Um, and so he started off on this five-month journey. And time went by so quickly. And that's kind of what happens, right? When we're doing what we love, it just goes by so quickly. And so here's Carl in the summer, and he's taking his photographs. And then August came. And August came quickly. As I said, he was just enthralled with what he was doing. And so he had August and he knew it was going to start getting cold and he knew it was time to exit. But there was a little problem. Carl could not really remember if he had hired the bush pilot to pick him up. He had did all this planning but couldn't remember if he had planned for his departure. Now remember, Carl is in the middle of nowhere. By the end of August, it was clear to Carl <laughs> he had not. Carl's in a serious situation here. So he writes in his journal... I think I should have used more foresight about arranging my departure. I'll soon find out. I hope you're sitting there saying, yes, Carl, that was an important part of planning. Not just to get there, but how to get out of there. Carl had no exit plan. Now, Carl did leave maps with his father, with his friends, telling them where he would be. But Carl did not really tell them when he planned to return. Carl was kind of this free-spirited guy, and he kind of like, I know what I'm doing. Leave me alone. Don't worry about me. I'll be fine. In fact, in a previous time, his father did get worried about him, called the, the, the authorities, called the police to check on him. Carl was fine. Carl told his dad, don't do that. So his dad was very reluctant to do anything when Carl didn't show back up in August. Now, the stories I read, a little confusion as to exactly why this came about. One story says his, his family, his friends did indicate to the state troopers he was gone. Others, this, this trooper was, was going out. But anyways, a state trooper flew over and spotted Carl but talked about how Carl did not appear to be in any type of dire situation, any type of distress. Carl did see the, the plane when it flew over. And when he saw the plane fly over, he just thought, okay, finally, someone to save me. And he got out of his tent and he raised his hands and he, he's like, all right, yes. And then the plane flew away. And Carl kind of thought, why did he fly away? And then apparently, I don't know why it's this way, Carl figured it out. And he wrote about it in his journal. He says, turns out that's the signal for all okay. Don't wait. So apparently if you go like this, that means I'm okay. And that's why the pilot flew away. And so Carl writes, it's certainly my fault I'm here now. Man, I can't believe it. I really feel like a klutz. So now Carl really starts to be in despair. Somebody knows he's there but thinks he's fine. And so by October, he was struggling to find food. 
Remember, he brought enough food up to August. So he started hunting certain animals to try to supplement his food supply to, to make it last. He was getting cold and frostbite. By November, his food had run out. He was cold. He was weak. He was miserable. He was all alone. Sometime around Thanksgiving, he made his final journey entry. And it says this. Dear God in heaven, please forgive my sins and weakness. Please look over my family. Carl had enough wood and fuel and stuff to make one final fire. In which he did. And he enjoyed the warmth of that fire until it went out. And then Carl took one of his rifles and ended his life. Isn't that a terrible story? That's just an awful story. And when we look at stories like this, people that, that know about Carl, and here's a picture of Carl out in the wild and I don't know how long before all this happened, this picture was taken, but that's what Carl looked like. A lot of people think about Carl and say, what a fool. To plan so meticulously and then not to plan for a departure. Well, I want you to hold that thought. If that's kind of what you're thinking about Carl, because it might get a little bit worse. In one of the stories I read, it said that Carl was informed that there was a log cabin about five miles from his campsite. Now, if that's true from what he wrote and, and from what we know of the story. Carl made no effort to try to find that log cabin. But you can imagine that would have definitely helped in some ways his situation. But for some reason, if that's true, he didn't look for it. All the stories I read had this, that the nearest civilization to where Carl was was Fort Yukon, about 75 miles away. You say, well, that's, that's too far away to travel in November, and with all the snow and he's cold, yeah, absolutely, but what about August? I mean, I know it's the, the Alaskan wilderness, but he's got rifles, he's got food, he... He could travel at least, what, 10 miles, maybe 15 miles a day. It stays light a lot longer. You would think, wow, it, <laughs> that's what I would have done. Best shot of safety of surviving. And as people read this story about Carl, that's one of the things that they're very confused about. Why didn't Carl do that? Why did he just stay there with no hope, being miserable? And though there's lots of theories, there's just no answer. So this is an ugly, terrible story. And you might be saying, why, why did you tell this story? Why did Brother Banning tell this story? Well, remember I said, we're going to use Carl's story as a parable. And I want you to think about Carl as a parable. And I think you'd have to admit that most people, what, live their life just like Carl. They plan their life meticulously to enjoy it. I mean, there's people that plan their, their academic life to, to, the, to, the, 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 to the, 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 the quintessential detail, right? At high school, I'm going to go to a certain high school. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to get straight A's. I'm going to get scholarships so that I can go to this college. And I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to be a lawyer. I'm going to be a CEO. I'm going to do this. But those people have no exit Strategy. A lot of them. 
There was a girl one time that got a perfect score on her SATs. I mean, she didn't get one question wrong on her SATs. And obviously she became world-renowned. People wanted to interview her. They were interviewing her. And one of the reporters asked her, what do you think the meaning of life is? And she says, I don't, I don't know. Perfect score. All this knowledge. But she hadn't figured out life. There are people that meticulously plan out for their adult life. That they're going to work for this company and they're going to have this many children. And they're going to live in this city. And, 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 and we're going to plan all the way until retirement. So that I can then, what? Eat, drink, and be merry. And some people get so caught up in details of life and enjoy what they're doing, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if you don't have an exit plan, then you're like Carl. Many people live life just like Carl. And I'm going to use a teaching tool that Jesus used himself. If you agree with me that Carl was foolish... And that it's been foolish to wander the Alaskan wilderness with no exit plan. Let me ask you, how much more so to journey through this life with no concrete plan for departure? Or to resolve yourself with a bunch of false platitudes that people talk about in regard to the departure of this life? How much more so, if we see Carl as a fool, how much more so those who are like Carl in life? So, as we close this lesson, I want to bring out a few things that we can learn from Carl. Things that we need to know from Carl's story. A Carl as a parable. And number one, as I think we all know, but we need to get the message out. We need to know the end is coming. There's coming a time, no matter how much fun we're having, we're going to have to exit. It's going to come to an end. And that's one of the key messages, one of the key purposes of the Bible. I mean, Carl knew that at some point he had to go home. But he was having too much fun planning and too much fun doing to really think about it, apparently. Let's go over to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. We're just going to look at a couple passages. But, but brothers and sisters Christ, we can look at passage after passage after passage that makes the same point. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. And as we read this, I, I want to bring out a certain focus on this. In Hebrews 9, verse 27. And as much as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment... So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. Now, verse 27, right? There's an end coming. Every man is appointed to live once, die once, and then comes the judgment. This is that passage that basically destroys the whole idea of reincarnation. But I want you to notice verse 28. It's not just, hey, as a human being, you're going to come to an end one day. There's going to be an exit to your life. But because of that reality, verse 28 came about. Because that, Christ did what he did. Christ offered himself to bear the sins of the many. And Christ will then come a second time for salvation. The fact that there's going to be a departure, there's going to be an end, made Christ, motivate Christ to do what he did. And he's coming back in reference to salvation to those who are prepared, to those who have an exit strategy, those who eagerly await him. Carl was not eagerly awaiting the bush pilot. It wasn't even a thought until August. 
And there's some people who don't think about their departure until it comes upon them. Let's take a look as well at 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 9 through 14. 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning of verse 9. Peter, by inspiration, writes these words, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. And look at this. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be? We read that as kind of a question, but it's not really a question by Peter. It's really a statement. We would write it this way. This is the way you should be. There's an end coming even to earth. And because that's a reality, we should have a reaction to it. Just as Jesus had a reaction to the departure, the exit, we need to have a reaction. And what is that action or reaction? We ought to be people in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming day of God. Look at verse 14. And therefore, beloved... Since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. You see, the Bible doesn't just say, hey, there's an end coming to your life, that one day you're going to have to depart. It says that because that's a fact, there needs to be a reaction. Jesus had a reaction, and you need to have a reaction. You need to have an exit plan. It doesn't matter how much fun we're having in this world. We need to know the end is coming and we need to have an exit plan, an exit strategy. And that exit plan, obviously, is God's plan written for us in the scripture. This plan that Peter is telling us about. But I would imagine a lot of people are like Carl. They're just having too much fun. They don't want to sacrifice. They don't want to be all these things. They want to have their own fun. There's just not enough time to think about it. Number two, as we think about Carl, we need to know what matters. What's really important. I think there's a lot of people like Carl who just, just get that all messed up. Let's, let's take Carl. Let's go back to the beginning of the story. I would imagine that as I, I was starting off telling you about Carl, and Carl's going to do this, this five-month trip out in the Alaskan wilderness, that at the beginning, he looked like a really smart guy. He was planning with all those provisions and the rifles and the film, 500 rolls of film, and he just looked like he was with it. <laughs> Brother Banning talks about in, in the sermon about what it would have been like to, to go to his house and have all these things. It must have been a mess. All these provisions, all these things all over the place. But he was planning. He was being wise. He was being smart. But it was kind of a deceptive view of Carl. He was wise and smart to a degree. But all that looks like foolishness because he didn't know what was really important. Having an exit plan. And there's people in this world that are the same way. People in this world that, man, it looks like they have it all figured out. They've got the plan. They're executing the plan. They've got it going. But a lot of those people... Their whole plan is to try to make heaven here on earth. They don't have an exit plan. You see, Carl did figure out he needed an exit strategy. But here's the problem. It was too late. And we could use Carl as some of the platitudes people tell people. 
But it kind of shows the truth of those. Carl, don't worry. You're going to be okay. But Carl wasn't okay. Oh, Carl's in a better place. But Carl's not in a better place. The, the, the interesting thing is the story of Carl is found in the Bible. In fact, Jesus tells us the story of Carl. You're like, wait a second, I don't remember Carl. That's not a biblical name. Well, he doesn't mention Carl by name, but maybe you even thought about this story as we introduce Carl's story. Let's go over to Luke chapter 12 as Jesus relates to us in a parable the story of Carl. Luke chapter 12. We're going to read 16 through 21. Jesus told them a parable saying, The land of a rich man was very productive and began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns. I will build larger ones. And there I will store my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Isn't that Carl's story? You see, the problem wasn't what Carl was doing. The problem with this man wasn't what, that he was a success, that he was building larger barns. The problem with Carl wasn't what he was doing. The problem with Carl was what he wasn't doing. What he hadn't done. Or as Brother Banning put it, the problem with this man and Carl wasn't what they had. It's what they didn't have. One of the questions that come out of this is, what happened to those pictures? Did the snow destroy the rolls of film? That's, that's possible. Maybe the family were able to retrieve them, but it was just a, a, a terrible reminder of Carl's story, and they, they just didn't do anything with them. I, I tried to find them on the Internet. I didn't spend a lot of time. I couldn't find them. It kind of reminds me where Jesus says, now who will own what you have worked for, what you have planned? You see, brothers and sisters of Christ, we need to know what matters. We think there's a lot of things in this world that are so important, and they're not. They don't add a single cubit to our salvation. They don't add anything to where we want to be, where we're headed. So as we look at Carl, we need to know that the end is coming. There's going to be an exit. And we need to know what really matters. And thirdly, we need not to miss our cues. We need not miss our cues. What does that mean? Well, Carl had cues that he was in trouble. But he apparently ignored them. He had cues that woke him up to his situation, and he actually had a way, it appears, that he could help his situation, if not get out of it. Again, if that log cabin was there, that would have been a way to, to, to definitely maybe prolong his, his life till maybe the winter was over, I don't know. Definitely, in August, making that track of 75 miles, trying to get to Fort Yuka, that... That's unfathomable that he didn't do that. He had these cues. And he just, for one reason or another, we don't know. That's the mystery of Carl's story. He just ignored them. You see, when we talk about a cue, 
things happen to us that put life in perspective. These are the cues I'm talking about. You get sick. You get diseased. You lose your job. You lose a family member. These are things that shake up our life that say, man, things are put into perspective. But there's a lot of people that, that just kind of ignore those. There's a lot of people who have gone through very tragic life and death situations to survive. And, and, and being interviewed to tell their story, almost all of them say the same thing. I don't look at life the same way anymore. They picked up on the cue. Look, if you would, at Ecclesiastes. Let's go back to the Old Testament. Let's go to Ecclesiastes. Chapter 7. One of the biggest cues that God has given to us, the very purpose for these, is a funeral. Look at Ecclesiastes 7, beginning verse 2, where Solomon by wisdom and inspiration writes, it is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. Now, brothers and sisters in Christ, if you're like Carl and you have no exit plan and you're just enthralled and having a good time in this life, you read those words and you're like, that just doesn't sound right. <laughs> I don't want to go to a feast. That's not fun. But the last part of that verse explains why Solomon says that. Because that is the end of every man. The end, there's that word again, the end of every man and the living takes it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for when a face is sad, a heart may be happy. What Solomon is saying is when you go to a funeral, it's a cue. It puts things into perspective. You need to realize how sad it is how it might be a morbid thought, but one day it's not going to be you going to a loved one's funeral. It's going to be your loved one's going to your funeral. But so many people don't pick up on that cue. Brother Banning talked about as a preacher, and I know this really well, that as a preacher we're called to go to a lot of funerals. In fact, I've done much more funerals, many more funerals than I have weddings here in Brea. And a lot of times we're an active part of that funeral. And he says, I have noticed something over the last 30 years about funerals. that They've changed. And he says, one of the things that's changed is they're smaller. A lot of people don't go to funerals. He says the second thing is they're a lot grayer. <laughs> Young people, they don't go to funerals. It's not a good time. It's too sad. But if you have a party, oh man, the young people will be there. They'll be at the house of feasting. Someone says that doesn't do you any good. There's no cues there. There's no wake-up calls. You see, brothers and sisters Christ, we need not to miss our cues. And I would say we are here because of those cues. So whether this, this lesson hits you squarely between the eyes and the heart, or, or if it doesn't because you have understood these things, you know people that are just like Carl. Just ask them, do you have an exit plan? Part of preaching the gospel is putting things into perspective for people. Maybe you're the cue God is sending. So we need to know our end is coming. We need to know what really matters and we need not miss our cues. And so, as we bring our lesson to a close, I want to ask you, do you have an exit plan? Maybe you're listening 
Maybe someone asked you to listen. And if you're still listening to this, be honest with yourself. If your exit plan doesn't come from the Word of God, it's not an exit plan that's going to get you where you need to go. Don't be like Carl. I, I want to tell you, I remember being at Cal State Florida and before I became a Christian. I was religious. I wasn't a Christian. I wasn't a New Testament Christian. I remember there was this, this evangelist out there in the quad and he was saying all sorts of things. And one of the things he asked, he said, do you know for certain that you're going to heaven? And I, re I remember I was pricked to the heart. Because honestly, I didn't know. I was religious. But I didn't know the Bible. I was too busy with college and working and all my planning in life and having a good time with friends. But that's when I started praying. I need to know the Bible. That was my cue. And if you are honest like me, and I ask you that question, are you for certain that you're going to be in heaven, that you have eternal life, and that pricks your heart like, I don't know, like, you, like if you were like me. Well, don't be like Carl and miss the cue and not have an exit plan, an exit strategy. If we can help you have God's plan, to have knowledge of that, to fulfill that, if we can baptize you into Christ for the mission of your sins, let that be known this morning as together we stand and as we sing.